Good day, Julian. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Hey, Guy, it's great to, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. You're most welcome. Now, this is the first time you and I have ever communicated uh, uh, ver you know, face to face, so to speak, even though we're doing this virtually. Um, but I've not uh, met or talked with you, but I've been following you on LinkedIn and on Twitter for a while. And uh, so I was very interested to uh, do this interview with you. Uh, for our audience, I'm going to take you through a kind of a four part uh, series of questions here to kind of introduce you to our audience. And let's start with what's your name and where did you grow up? <laughs> so my name is uh, Julian Stodd and I grew up on the south coast of the UK uh, by the sea. Uh, I've progressed west along the coast, but I've never never made it away from the seaside. So that's always been part of my life. And I'm, I'm well, currently that, down. That, in the... Yeah, that explains the, the sea salt uh, uh, language that you use in your uh, in some of your writings and, and your websites. Um, so where did you go to college and what did you study? So uh, you'll pretty much straight away get a, a sense of uh, me being a generalist because I, first of all, I studied archaeology and material science uh, was my undergraduate uh, degree. And uh, I was really very lucky because I'd intended to do an arts degree, but archaeology falls into both camps. Sometimes it's a BA, sometimes it's a BSc. And I was lucky that it was a BSc because it kind of trapped me into science um, where I might not have found my way into it. So I, I always consider myself extremely lucky that, that, that I ended up uh, doing the BSc. <laughs> and uh, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you live now and, and what kind of work you do? Yeah, so I, uh, I moved to, to Bournemouth to do my degree and then I stayed here. I, I, I dived into about seven years of uh, postgraduate work where I floundered around in the, in the way that you do when you are kind of curious and want to delve further into stuff. But I was struggling to find exactly what it was that I wanted to do. My work at that, st at that stage was exploring the psychology and neurophysiology of learning. So kind of what happens in our brain and particularly how we kind of construct our sense of the world around us. How do we create the stories that we, um, that we think and operate within? So I was kind of enjoying that and becoming progressively more broke as I did so. Um, and uh, at that point um, of seven yeah, nearly seven years in, um, I had the opportunity to uh, start up the e-learning arm of a, a business. Uh, this is around 2000 when um, a lot of big organizations, in, in our case, uh, strong focus on financial services, were trying to do all these magical things about cutting costs and scaling and um, rolling out e-learning programs. So it just so happened that my work coincided with what the market was looking for. And I ended up um, setting up a, 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 an e-learning um, team as part of a training company. And, uh, and that really carried me into the organizational space. So the pendulum kind of swung from uh, academia right through into quite hard-nosed uh, business, as anybody will know who's, who's worked in um, that kind of instructional design for sale area you know profits are there but you have to work hard to find them and uh it's uh you know it's a challenging field at the time when the technology was still emergent so it's funny when i think back now much of our work on those e-learning programs would involve setting up servers and physically driving them around and plugging them into systems and burning cd-roms and you know you, you just spend an incredible amount of time talking about infrastructure. And in fact, we, we used to make good money selling infrastructure. You know, people would think they were buying learning, but what you were really giving them was the infrastructure for storytelling and collaboration. And that was really, those were really the first two chapters of my 
well, career is probably stretching it, uh, the term a bit far, but <laughs> this, this, first of all, uh, sort of unpaid area of exploration um, through my postgraduate work and then into this really exciting, but ultimately rather unfulfilling um, e-learning business. And I sort of say that, I hope respectfully, because I'm very grateful to the opportunities it gave me. Uh, ultimately, we sold that business um, to a, a big American company called GP Strategies, General Physics, as it was back then. Um, so, you know, financially, it was successful and, and high reputation and so on. But I realized that wasn't where my where my uh, drive was. You know, I wanted to be getting back into the research and the exploration and really helping organizations change and adapt to be more effective. So uh, what are you doing more lately here? What Tell us a little bit about your business and your clients and what services and products that you render to that marketplace. Yeah, so that was around, you know, kind of 2010 after I sold the business, it gave me the freedom to get back into researching and writing. And I, I was kind of very deliberate not to rush into anything. So I spent three years really developing what became the foundations of my work exploring the social age. So that, that term, the social age, is what I use to describe the evolved context of organizations. And it talks about how everything is a little bit different. So um, the ways that we collaborate, the ways that we consume knowledge, the types of knowledge we consume, the structures of power in our society, and indeed the structures of society, the ways that we are effective, Almost everything is a little bit different, driven by technology very often. But why my work explores the social age rather than the digital age is because whilst I love technology, I'm really interested in how it changes us as people. And, you know, in the introduction, you touched on this. So whilst we have not met before, neither are we strangers to each other. So we are connected, radically connected in ways that are highly significant in our practice. Um, so I used that time to set up that premise. And in, in 2014, I did two things. I published um, my first book, or my first sort of major book, which was the Social Leadership Handbook. And that explored leadership at the intersection of formal and social systems. And I also set up Sea Salt Learning as the company that would sit behind that and that book you know there was sort of, the most important thing about that book is it was substantially wrong and that set the tone for much of my um, work that came after that finding a, a space where I can be um, working out loud is a, is a term that I describe my sort of method of working and kind of creating a space where I can be wrong um, and hopefully sort of open to being wrong. So the chapters on community in that book were very naive. They were really describing aspiration and belief rather than what we saw through research. It took me till 2018, 2019, till I ran a big research project around that and then substantially we did that in the second edition of the book. Um, my focus on technology was wrong in that work. I didn't have the language to describe it. So now I say social leadership is leadership at the intersection of formal and social systems. But I didn't have that language when I wrote the book. I, I sort of have found it through my practice afterwards. So, you know, now I've, I think I've just published my 16th book and over 2,000 articles on the blog. And I maintain that um, ability to be wrong about stuff. Uh, and sometimes it's just a dead end. You know, sometimes you get excited and interesting in, some, in something and almost nobody else is interested or excited about it. And of course, sometimes you, you light the fuse and it just explodes. Um, some of the recent work I've been doing around quiet leadership, leadership in the smallest of actions, um, or the work on the socially dynamic organization, which looks at kind of organizational design uh, in the context of the social age. That's, some of that stuff has just exploded. Uh, the trust research, a big research project I did on trust, just got a ton of interest. So, you know, that's my world 
today is um, none of my work is perfect. I feel I can say that before other people tell me it. None of it's perfect. Um, and indeed, much of it isn't even joined up yet. And sometimes I go to quite significant lengths to, to, to push it apart, to stop it becoming safe. But there's lots of people, many of whom I like and admire, who've had great insight and have written the book and, and become famous and they trade off that work. And, you know, part of me would love to have that. I'd love to be able to sit down and draw the perfect picture, the beautiful thing and have the answer. Um, but I can't. Sometimes, sometimes it's tantalizingly close as if it's in my head, but um, my work is still exploring a landscape. And you'll see, you know, anybody that follows my work will see some themes. One is I use a lot of language around landscapes and exploration. And partly that's because la that's language I'm comfortable with. You know, that's my way of understanding the world. But I also kind of see it like that. We have to walk around this landscape and... Um, construct our sense of understanding, be willing to get lost and listen to the stories that other people bring us about their experiences as they explore that landscape. And luckily, I'm a generalist in a, in a, a world that is quite forgiving of generalists at the moment. And my work is often very simple, but I do take some pride in the fact that it's quite practical and grounded so i start with ideas but i nearly always bring it down to what you can do about this things that you can try and you'll see that you know my latest work social leadership daily is like 60 seconds a day it's a daily publication just to put social leadership into practice it's disposable it's almost insignificant um but crucially it's today so it's lots of people doing small things today on their practice. And I find that very interesting. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing all that with us. I, yeah, I, 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 in following you, you are working out loud and sharing out loud and thinking out loud. And, and you've talked about, you know, not being uh, afraid to be wrong. And I think that that's very, um, inspiring to other people that you should, you know, be willing to venture into things and explore ideas, which is what I think you're doing is you're exploring ideas and then and drawing conclusions from, I guess, research. And I'd like to talk, uh, learn a little bit more about these research projects. Are these client funded? Are these government funded? But what can you share with us about the, the research that you have done and, and what you've learned from that? Uh, whether or not you proved yourself right or wrong. But what can you share with us about that? So um, my, I've done, you know, done quite a range of research projects. The biggest of them have been looking at what you could probably call some of the social currencies. So the big research project, The Landscape of Trust, which looked at the nature of trust between two people within communities and teams and into organizations themselves. The Landscape of Communities, looked simply at the communities that people inhabit and what they do within them and how they behave in them and how they join them and how they're held together and how they blow apart. Um, smaller research projects looking at the nature of belief, the way that we believe in people, the way that we believe in the organisations that we work for. Uh, quiet leadership, uh, that research work looks at um, humility, kindness, fairness, and, um, and essentially about change, you know, how change happens. So this work is generally qualitative. I, I mean, sometimes I can get to uh, some numbers, but it is essentially qualitative and quite often involves uh, discourse analysis or sentiment analysis. Um, it's quite often at quite large scale, and it's a bit of a mixture. I, I'm very fortunate that... Um, I work with, you know, just some of the most interesting organizations in the world uh, across a whole range of sectors. So the, you know, the tech companies, uh, pharma, manufacturing, but also into government and military and NGO structures. And I always say about kind of half of um, the clients I work with uh, kind of take me as they find me. They're very happy to, to, to back and support that work. And the others, you know, probably the more sensible ones, kind of want to see it iterate and develop and find some structure 
and that they'll often take it on. And that's good. You know, that, that gives me a, a discipline. It gives me a space to be curious, to develop the work. And it gives me a space to find um, practical application within it. So actually, we put quite a lot of effort into the um, development, the methodology for prototyping and developing our programs um, because our business operates at some scale. And so you need structure um, and you need, you, know, you need rigor and you need quality assurance in that work. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really very, um, it's very fascinating. I, I always say that, you know, we are research based because we are, you know, I, even when it's inconvenient, which it can be. Um, and, and that shows in our work, the iterative nature of, of our work. And I, and I write and publish every day. You know, I publish on the blog every day. I publish Social Leadership Daily every day. I, I, I publish a lot of stuff, but that shouldn't be confused or mistaken with publishing good stuff. It, it's, it, you know, much of it um, iterates and changes. The, the book I've just published is almost embarrassing because it's, a, it's um, The Humble Leader is so far at the qualitative, subjective end of the scale. I I almost say it's a journalistic effort, not a research effort. There is research behind it, but it is very much just asking people what they feel, what they believe and so on. Um, But I'm kind of okay with that. I don't know if I'd want that to be my, you know, life's work and reputation because I I, I like some of the harder stuff. I'm very interested at the moment in structurally how organisations change and in how the social currencies operate and work. I'm very interested in, in um, learning science and carrying that work into the, 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 the broader organisational context. But, you know, it, it, part of my sort of day-to-day challenge is, is to continue to be lost in work, to, um, to be unafraid to sort of venture out and uh, explore things and that's probably very true of the the research project I'm just running at the moment it's brand new uh, which is called these are me uh, the identity project and I'm going into this work with a very clear realization that it may fail I, I mean it's more likely than not it will fail um, and by which I mean it will run out of steam it just won't be interesting I won't be able to figure out what it all means but I've, I've I'm interviewing initially 50 people uh, asking them to bring their three identities, three identities that are important to them. And I, I'm sort of spurred into doing this because organisations in general are trying to forge different types of engagement with the people that work for them. They don't just want their utility, they want their engagement. They want them to be curious and exploring and learning together and collaborating, and things that money doesn't really buy. But what if there isn't just one of us. What if there are many different versions of us and nobody gets to see them all? And and what if your work identity isn't even one of the top three? And funnily enough, and I've only completed the first three interviews and none of them have bought me their work identity. It's the number one. Um, some of them have hidden identities or identities in conflict. So, you know, that's an example, I guess, of how I start this type of work. It's, it, it's really interesting. Um, I think it's relevant for leadership because if people inhabit complex um, landscapes of identity, then that's relevant for us as leaders, both to ensure that people have the space and opportunity to explore that and that we don't accidentally or, of course, deliberately kind of abuse or mishandle that. It's relevant to culture, which is simply the aggregation of all of our actions to each other over time. It's relevant for learning because... um, some types of knowledge are linked to identity. So if we are inhabiting different types of identity, different identities, we may get access to different knowledge or process that knowledge differently. It's relevant for change because change is inherently a violent act against identity. Um, You know, as I ramble, that's what you, that's what, you know, anybody that is familiar with my work will get that. It rambles on, it just, it wanders around the landscape. And sometimes, sometimes it comes together in (laughs) decent ways um some of my work is pretty good and some of it feels pretty good to me and probably makes no sense to anybody else and some of it just quietly rolls under a hedge and dies Uh, and I think that's how it should be you know I think that's um that's not a bad thing 
No, I, I agree. I think that's a, it's fascinating. Uh, you have the ability to explore things and see where they lead, and not everything is going to lead to something that's fruitful. It could be a dead end. And uh, but there you go. That's that's you've learned something about what is and what isn't, and what works and what doesn't work, and and how to look at things and maybe how not to look at things. I I think it's very very interesting. Um, this video series that I'm doing is about uh, human performance technology, HPT, also known by a variety of other names, human performance improvement, or simply evidence-based practices, which when I started back in the late 70s and early 80s was known as research-based. So it was interesting that you brought that phrase up. But um, what was your first exposure to evidence-based practices in the learning field. And, and what I want to do is, is identify some of these uh, people or books or articles so we can point the audience to them so that they might follow up uh, and, and look at them further. But who was influential to you when you first started? So I should say, you know, when we were preparing for this, I, 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 was, I, I felt this sort of overwhelming concern that you would be disappointed in what I would say <laughs> because uh, because uh, my um you know I, I I don't know why I shouldn't admit it but I you know I I, my, I generally don't read um much in the way of you know business books and I certainly don't read leadership books I don't read all that stuff my my reading is 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 really all over the place um and my influences are all over the place. So I, I can pull in some uh, threads. You know, the first time that I, I became really interested in this would be somewhere um, in, the, in the late 90s when I was doing my uh, research um, into the ways that we learn. And it, it specifically what I was looking at was how people construct their understanding of history from artifacts, from the things that are left behind. So, you know, you go to an archeological site like Stonehenge and there were some rocks in a modern landscape and your understanding isn't held in knowing the composition. Well, one type of understanding is held in knowing the composition of that rock, but the rock really just um, subdivides space. It's the positioning of the rock within a landscape which gives it context. And already, as I say that to you now, I probably haven't thought about this for a long time, but it's that word context becomes important. You pretty rapidly learn that our sense of understanding is contextual and is based on understanding context. And you also pretty rapidly learn that things are not real. Things are, to a large extent, um, have some measurable properties, but a lot of the value in them is imbued into them. We put value into things. So you'll hear, you know, in my language already, it becomes relevant because you start to understand that organizations aren't real, systems and processes aren't real, um, markets aren't real, economies aren't real, uh, structures of power and law and even nationhood are not real. They're all made up. Some things are real, you know, like this pen I'm fiddling with, I always have something in my hands messing about with. This pen is real. I could weigh it. Um, I could, uh, you know, analyze it and tell you what it's made of, but that wouldn't give you its value. This is one of the pens that I drew the leaves for the Humble Leader book, uh, the pen and ink illustration. So to me, this pen has more value than just the plastic and metal that it's made of. So th the people that were influential to me in that work um, were uh, probably primarily, I, I was very influenced by Oliver Sacks, the neurologist, um, for two reasons. Um, firstly, because I just adore the way he can tell a story around complexity. So he was a great communicator. So he let me find my way into a subject because he understood that meaning is not, you know, meaning kind of in inverted commas, the meaning we create does not rely on me understanding all of his underlying thinking and all of his vast technical knowledge. Of course, he was a generalist as well. He, 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 he had this incredibly broad um, knowledge of the world. It, it relies on us giving people 
the stories and, and conceptual framework by which they can uh, understand something. And of course, much of his work as a neurologist involved working with people who had been damaged in some way. So understanding that we can use that sense of, of, of fault or failure or damage to understand the system better. Mm -hmm. So he was highly influential, um, I would say still is highly influential on, um, on my work. The other person is, is going to be really somewhat peculiar, um, which is Terry Pratchett, the fantasy author. Um, and the reason why, again, I have found his work influential is because he paints portraits of people. And he had this incredible ability to use a very few words to create a space within which you constructed a very full picture of what the person would be. And that's a remarkably difficult trick to pull off. So again, as I talk to you about it now, I realize both of these people were storytellers, essentially. Um, both of them kind of found their way into their careers, I guess. Um, and, you know, they, they've both been influential. One gave me kind of creativity. The other gave me a bit more discipline and, and rigor. Latterly, I'm more... Um, influenced by uh, economic theory, uh, sociology. Um, I think, and yeah, really just um, still quite broad influences. Um, sort of struggle to, to pinpoint, you know, one uh, very specific influence on my current work. I, 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 I read very broadly, um, but also um, I tend to be quite comfortable uh, reading things which have no apparent immediate benefit or use. Uh, I, I, I remember a, a fantastic uh, book, I think it's by Mark Kalin Kalansky, Kalinsky, so I'm and not that he'll ever hear me mispronouncing his name. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gun, which is a social history of the AK-47. And it's absolutely fascinating and has been very influential on my understanding of organisational systems because he describes how the AK-47 is designed to be rickety and rattly and not precision engineered. And hence it is remarkably adaptable. It also ties into the social context because it was used as a tool of the projection of power through the licensing of its manufacture. And indeed, um, Kalashnikov himself as a, a figure that was written into stories. Um, so that's, you know, just to give you an idea of the random nature of my, uh, of my reading. <laughs> well, well, thank you again for sharing that. Let me shift gears here a bit with my next question. If you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what it is you currently do, so as to provide an example to our audience as to how one might uh, articulate and present themselves in terms of what they do, what would your 30 second elevator or lift speech be? <laughs> so uh, my work explores the context of the social age and to understand what that means for leadership, for learning, for culture and for change. So it's working with typically global organizations that are trying to become something else. And I will work typically with leadership teams, uh, particularly across that learning and leadership space to help them look at the world through a different lens. Um, this kind of slightly cracked and fragmented lens of the social age. So giving them a space and an opportunity to uh, find different ways of looking at the world and hence different ways of acting within it. Thank you. Again, let me switch gears here a bit. As a lifelong learner, uh, can you share with us what your current focus or next focus of learning is and, and tell us about any writing that you're doing uh, regarding that? Yeah, I've... Um... It, it, it's quite normal for me to have a few projects on the go at the moment. <laughs> so uh, I have one pro project called Learning Fragments. And this uh, came out of um, in 
2020, I was starting to feel a bit uh, disillusioned with um, the whole learning and development space. Um, I'd written a, a series of, of books. I kind of felt I'd uh, and you know I'd been very successful with that work, but also I was just finding a bit of frustration at um, kind of the pace of change in organisations and where to take it. So I, I set out to deliberately sort of vandalize my own work because I realized that we so easily get trapped into thinking about things within the, the frame, the context, the knowledge that we already hold. So I started learning fragments. Initially, I, 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 as a text-based exercise and then latterly as a video blog that sits alongside my other work where I try and take ideas and really kick them around, utterly unafraid to talk nonsense really, just to try to develop the new vocabulary. Because I realized in my own learning and development, finding the vocabulary, the language with which to explore ideas is half the battle. And recently I've been sort of mainstreaming that work and bringing it back in and feeling pretty pleased about it. It's really helping me find the next area of more formal um, exploration. And so where, where that sort of carries me is, you know, what am I writing uh, alongside that? I've, I've been uh, developing out this uh, social leadership daily work, the work about being in practice. I'm doing that because it's a super engaged community. To give you a sense of it, the, the community I have around that work is about one thirtieth of the size of the community I have around the blog, but it's the most engaged community. And it's full of people who are just getting on and trying to figure out how it all works and what to do about it and what that's let me do is start using a language about being in practice what does it mean to be in practice where do you find space to experiment to explore that's led into my major research project at the moment which is um, sort of has a working title of the experimental organization but it's research across uh, what will actually be 60 odd um, global companies looking at how they experiment and how they handle failure. I've completed some um, prototype work on that and it's been really fascinating. It looks at um, how they figure out what they want to experiment in, how they initiate experiments, what kind of capability they believe they need in order to experiment. Um, culturally, how they are able to hold the ability to experiment and how they handle failure and how failure permeates back into the system to inhibit them thinking differently. Uh, and that's been good. I've been able to, to do that prototype work with some senior leaders across those businesses. And it's been fascinating. You know, about half of them describe that they are essentially unable to experiment. Um, some of them take very structured approaches to building capabilities. Some of them have no structured approach at all. A whole range of different approaches to governance. And that's really encouraging to me. When I start research, what I want to figure out is if everybody says and does the same thing, or if people do wildly different things, it's always much more interesting if they do wildly different things. So I've got that uh, kicking on. Um, the Humble Leader publishes actually, uh, I think at the end of this month, I, I've just, I actually published that with a Kickstarter campaign because I've, been very interested recently um, in publishing and actually looking at spinning out the publishing part of our business because there's a ton of really interesting work around magazine publishing. There's a real resurgence of magazine publishing. So I have a, a project called Radical Interpretations, which is uh, going to be my first magazine uh, for established and emergent voices exploring imagined futures. And this is really a way of building a community around some of the ideas that we need to explore. My final piece is the riskiest one. Um, I've just spent the weekend with a, a dear friend who's a, a very accomplished learning scientist um, planning our book on learning science. Uh, but I come to this having failed to complete a book on learning science. I wrote a whole book through, the, through lockdown. I wrote a whole book about learning science and it just wasn't very good. Um, and uh, she, she reviewed it for me and she said, really, she's very diplomatic. Uh, she said, really, 
uh, what you've got here is two books that you've kind of crashed together and merged in. And, and I just gave up. I just thought I can't, I can't pull this together. It's too complex for me. And we've been thinking, okay, let's do it together. We're quite different in our approaches and experiences. So I'm quite excited about that as a project that will uh, carry through to next year. So no shortage of stuff to keep me busy. <laughs> yes, you're, you are quite busy. You've got uh, uh, a number of things going on. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some of this uh, in, in the future. Let me shift gears here again. My next question is about the language, and you've spoken about language here, but but I've offered this question to my guests. Um, is there a performance improvement or a learning and development term or phrase that you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued, or you just simply want to put your spin on some familiar term or phrase, but what would you have for us? Well, that is an interesting one. <laughs> um, I will go with a very, si uh, well, a very simple term, uh, which is effectiveness. Um, I use that term as the kind of end state. So uh, I say if you kind of lined up all my work and understanding front to back, start to finish you'd probably start with disturbance like something is wrong <laughs> we need to do something we're curious or we're 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 out competed or we're confused you know you start with disturbance but where you end up with is effectiveness and i partly say that because it's important to me in my work that you don't just end up thinking differently you end up doing something differently so i think effectiveness is a pretty good proxy for learning, you know, instead of just saying you've learned something, I like to sort of nail it into effectiveness. But the challenge I would have is one which I explored in, in the book on the socially dynamic organization in, in 2019, that in the old model of organizational design, where we're trying to build consistency, conformity and replicability and scale, Effectiveness is held in people doing things in similar ways, in ways that we understand and can measure and find comfort within. But it's most likely that effectiveness in the future organization or socially dynamic one will be held in divergence, uh, not specifically in conformity, but within um, diverse capability. And some of that capability may be held by individuals. Some of it may be an emergent feature of effective and connected teams. So effectiveness could end up being quite an interesting word where the meaning of it will change and the mechanisms by which we find it will change. But it's a good anchor. You know, is what we are doing helping an individual or an organization to be more effective? And is it just helping them to be effective within the known domain or is it helping them to identify that future space or capability? It's interesting how quickly people lose sight of that when under pressure. You know, I, I, I've been working recently in an organization that is changing and they have a very capable team, very bright, capable team who know, they have the knowledge they need to be effective, but change is making them fearful and they are editing out the behaviors and conversations they need in order to truly change. And I think if they were honest with themselves about how effective their work is, it's currently less effective than it was. And the organization has made them that way because of a culture which will punish divergence in a time of change. So you engage in these safety making behaviors. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Effectiveness is, uh, for a current state and a future state. And, uh, but I think that, yeah, the, when you're undergoing changes or your organization is undergoing changes, they don't want a lot of diverse thinking and speaking because they want everybody to get on the same page in order to make the change. But sometimes that can lead them down the wrong path. And I guess they, we need to be much more open um, 
two uh, divergent thinking and expressions. Um, my second to the last question is related to an earlier question about influences. And, and what I want to do is I want to help point people to uh, uh, people and books and articles that uh, you think others should perhaps look into because they are influential uh, to you and your and your current and latest thinkings. So who who and what might you name? So the, the you see, you speak to somebody with a, a nine month old daughter and a three year old son. So I, the minute you start talking about books, I'm immediately thinking of the, the pile of books I've failed to read in the last three years. <laughs> and the bedtime stories we'll have tonight. Um, I think that there is, um, I mean, there's some obvious things to say. So if you look at the work that Donald Clark is doing at the moment um, in his uh, continuing blog series on learning um, theorists and his published work, I think Kogan Page published work on uh, learning technologies is, is, is um, you know, is very good. And Do Donald and I know each other and don't agree on everything. And I feel very lucky in that, you know, he's, he's, he's a, 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 I, I don't think Donald would mind me saying it's not hard to disagree with him. Um, because he, <laughs> he'd argue with himself if there was nobody else around to argue with. But, you know, that's important. Uh, I mean, to give you a sense of that, he, he will argue quite strongly against the very premise of leadership. And I, you know, write books about leadership, but, but we, we may well be right, you know. So I think we probably find um, challenge, I find challenge and value in, in his approach most of the time. Um, I think that there's a lot of interesting work actually around. Um, universal minimum wage, universal basic income, these kind of approaches. And the reason I find it valuable is because it's a reminder about the, the, what something I said earlier, that systems are largely made up. Um, organizations operate under the illusion that they will persist. And history tells us that is not the case. You know, the most likely outcome is that they will fail. And I... I um, published a funny little book called The New York Dereliction Walk, which explored organizations that had failed. And the, 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 it's, it's actually it's a walk through uh, Manhattan, through the physical spaces of those failed organizations and ideas and their rebirth through social movements. And you know, it's very clear that organizations believe they will persist, but they typically fail long before consequences imposed on them. So I like work which challenges sort of the assumptions. Um, and any time we feel this sort of visceral reaction to say, well, that's wrong, that can't possibly be right, we're probably onto something. Um, I'm, I'm a very, very undistinguished economist. You know, I, I failed my um, <laughs> I failed my economics A level. Um, if I, I think I got an N or something, like not even graded. I think probably the, the 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 marker just probably read it and entirely correctly thought why. How did you just pick up the wrong exam paper? But nonetheless, I try to sort of persist with that. And I, I find it's interesting, and you'll find it actually permeating into a lot of my work at the moment, talking about um, social currencies. And sometimes my work has a, very openly, has a quite liberal lean to it. But it's a mistake to think that makes it not valuable. Um, I try to be quite clear on that, you know, that it's okay to, to write work which is rigorous and it's also okay to write work and give your personal view and stance and opinion on it. Um, and I think I find it interesting. I'm just finding it very interesting looking at how we need to evolve our underlying structures of society and Funnily enough, that probably carries me back to um, just think about things I've enjoyed really reading this year. Books like The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, I've revisited. Um, and I think read a lot more into them this time than I did when I read them when I was, you know, in my 20s. 
Um, it's probably about the best I can get to to answer that question. I told you, I told you, you'd be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not disappointed. That's don't don't think that. Well, let let me uh, shift over to my final question, Julian. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. And my final question to you is uh, intended to address people entering into the field. So, what? words of wisdom, of advice, of guidance would you have for people entering into the world of learning and development? <laughs> I had to almost bite my tongue uh, before saying don't conform. You know, it's uh, because I think quite a few disciplines of the modern organization are very good at beating um, good ideas out of people. Um, in one of the organizations I'm working with at the moment, I quite often talk to them about their relationship with tenure. So when I speak to people in that organization, when I meet them for the first time, they invariably tell me how long they've worked there. It's a real cultural trait. But they do it in two different ways. Some of them say, well, of course, I've been here for 17 years. And hence, I have gravitas and safety, and I really know it inside out. And, you know, I'm a wise person within it. And they're right. They are a wise person within it is the, is the key thing. You know, they are within the culture. Other people say, I've been here 18 months, but they then proceed to sort of tell me how they haven't yet been indoctrinated, how they're holding out. So people describe their tenure in terms of either... Um, the way they inhabit it, or the way they sort of hold themselves outside it. And if we were talking in pure learning terms, we, we could talk about metacognition, you know, the ability to hold your systems thinking. We could say, you know, hold yourself outside the system. That's the key thing. Learn how to do the thing the way it is done now. But you have to be able to say this week, for one hour or 15 minutes, or in one community or one conversation, I'm gonna be able to pause, climb outside and look down upon the system and the thing that I'm doing. Because if you can't do that, you are trapped within context. And if you are trapped within context, you are perpetuating context. So this is really the irony of modern organizations. They generally want something different, but they kill it by their adherence to what they already have. Um, you know, I normally say, I don't think there's another, you know, nobody's making another podcast somewhere where they're trying to find people that block change, where they're trying to find people who can feed ignorance into the system, where they're, you know, trying to thwart our efforts. Just the opposite. The world is, and here you'll hear my liberal and optimistic tendencies come out. The world is generally full of good people doing good things. They just don't share the same view of good that I do and the same view of right as I do. So our challenge isn't specifically to conquer the other, it's to become more aware of self and more connected with other. So I try to put effort into working with, even collaborating with people who have quite different views from me, because that for me is much more valuable than just dismissing them. And I think that gives you some perhaps insight with which to step outside of the system and to look back in it. If we're going to be doing change for uh, continuous or discontinuous improvement efforts, we need that ability and we and the same old thinking that got us there that continues the current state is not what's going to be needed uh, to move forward and to change and adapt to the world as it evolves and as our, our markets and uh, uh, customers and stakeholders change. Julian, thank you so much for to do this interview with me. It was fascinating getting a chance to meet you and, and talk to you face to face. And I look forward to uh, seeing uh, your continued good work. Thanks again. Thank you.